These guys had and spent a couple of years out in obscure uh, islands teaching the natives about Shakespeare and the glories of Rome and all the rest of it. And they were very clear. They were tremendously multicultural in the sense that they knew tons and tons about other cultures. They knew phenomenal things about obscure tribes that nobody else was ever going to hear about. They could speak all kinds of obscure languages that nobody uh, is, is ever going to speak. Uh, and yet, the fact of the matter is, they knew all about these other cultures, but they knew which culture was objectively superior to that. Now you don't need to know anything about other cultures. The great thing about multiculturalism is it, it, it absolves you of knowing anything. You go to people who believe in multiculturalism and say, uh, well, uh, what are the, uh, what are the uh, principal exports of Nepal? They can't tell you. They can't tell you. You say, uh, what is the capital? I had this a couple of days after September 11th. I uh, went to Dartmouth College. I had to look something up in the library there. And outside the library, there's a demonstration saying, you know, um, uh, war is never the answer, one of these things. And these guys were standing around. Elites, people mortgage their houses to send their kids to this place. <laughs> they, uh, they go, uh, you know... They go, oh, this war's a terrible thing. They go, well, what you must remember, you've got to address the root causes. And I go, oh, yeah, what's that? And they go, well, uh, poverty breeds a resentment, breeds desperation, desperation breeds hostility, hostility breeds terror. I said, oh, yeah, what's the capital of Saudi Arabia? <laughs> nobody, nobody knows anything. Multi... <laughs> Multi multiculturalism is not about knowing anything about other cultures. It's just about feeling, uh, you know, warm and fluffy about them. And I'm sure Douglas, I'm sure every member on this panel has had this experience. You go on, you're giving some speech somewhere, you're on some uh, radio show, somebody calls in, and uh, they, want, they say, well, I think you're being, I had this experience on NPR the other day, somebody called up and goes, well, I think you're being very hierarchical. I never even knew that was a pejorative word. Uh, <laughs> And this, uh, this guy, uh, I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you've just said most uh, Muslim countries aren't free. Uh, and I said, look, that is, that is a fact. I said, if you, take, uh, if you take, for example, countries that just have 20% of the population's Muslim, only three of them qualify as free, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, uh, Benin and Suriname, and it will be interesting to see whether France will prosper as a fourth member of that group. And, uh, and the guy goes, well, what do you mean there isn't free? Uh, they're, they're not free. And not, so then you start reeling off objective statistics uh, about literacy, about uh, GDP per capita, uh, about uh, women's rights, about, uh, about uh, votes and democracy. These are facts, facts, what we used to call before the multicultural age, <laughs> facts. So you reel off five facts and the guy goes, oh yeah, well that's just your opinion. I mean... <laughs> Uh, Robert Frost, Robert, you know, Robert, Robert Frost famously said of free verse that it was like playing uh, tennis with the net down. And, and, the, uh, and the trouble with uh, having a dis tr trouble with dis you can't, d discussing cultural relativism with cultural relativists is like playing tennis with some guy who says your ace is just a social construct. Uh, <laughs> You, you can't, so that is why it is really the most elusive thing uh, that we have to deal with in, in, in our society. It's all but impossible uh, simply because it's a denial of reality. Yes, it